All right, so now we're going to talk about insect anatomy. Um, obviously, we've already kind of hit on what are insects to some degree, that um, they are a type of animal. I've actually run across people that are very educated but don't realize um, they're an animal, just like we are animals. How do we define animals? Animals are heterotrophs, meaning that they eat something to to survive and grow to be plants or animals or decaying stuff but they're heterotrophs meaning they eat something they consume it um, they can move usually they like the simplest animals don't like sponges but most all the rest of the animals that are complex do um, obviously a lot of them um, so they're multicellular, you know, those are the kind of things that we would think of as an animal, multicellular, eat other animals or, or stuff, move around usually. So those are some of the things that we use to define animals. There's more to it than that, but that's the general things. <clears throat> and then we have our phylum arthropodia. These are arthropods, and so these are organisms that have an exoskeleton. So even a crab, a decapod, you guys remember Mo Moana, decapod sings. Yep. That's one of my favorite um, Disney's. Anyway, um, so arthropods um, have an exoskeleton. And as I was, you'll see in the other video, they're kind of inside out and upside down in comparison to us, because our our skeleton's on the inside, right? And our heart is on our front side, and their heart is on their back side. Our nerves are on our back side, and <clears throat> our nerves are on our front side. And then, but the difference is these arthropods have six legs. Hexapodia is the superclass, and then the class is Entogonatha which is the in insects. And that's in reference to their mouth as well. Now there are some kind of what we call pseudo insects that are basically insects. Columbians are one of them. Um, and so we'll talk about these a little bit later, but they typically are found in soils. Now the insects, um, since we're talking mostly about their bodies, are divided into three different regions. There's obviously the head, there's the thorax, and then there's the abdomen. And we know that each one of these um, regions have segments. The thorax, for instance, is made up of three segments. The abdomen, anywhere from eight to 12 or more segments. And then the head is actually made up of multiple segments that have been fused together. The thorax um, typically is where, is where you're going to find the three legs, not typically, that's where you're going to find the three legs. There's going to be a leg on each segment. And then the last two segments, you'll find a pair of wings or halteres. If, they, if the insect has wings. Not all insects have wings though. And again, it doesn't mean that they have six legs all the time. Maybe they, they could lose some legs and stuff like that. But the idea is again, that they have six legs, at least either most of their body or their life cycle or not. But that's the, that's the defining characteristic is they have these six legs or have six legs. It might not be, be always obvious, but in most insects they are. And then they have an exoskeleton because they are an arthropod. Now their insect or their exoskeleton isn't made up of bone or anything like that, but they are strong structures um, made up of chitin and cuticle. Um, they um, have to be molted when they grow so the, the, they can reduce the hardening factors get rid of that cuticle, ingest it, and then usually have a new cuticle ready to go. That's what the caterpillars do anyway. 
cuticle and skin is dramatically different, chemically speaking. So that's one of the reasons why certain insecticides are only effective against insects and not humans. So while you wouldn't want to ingest insecticide, the reality is most insecticides wouldn't necessarily harm you, at least in an acute short-term manner. The modern insecticides, I'm not talking about the old school nicotine or anything like that, because your body chemistry and, and cuticles are dramatically different. That said, it wouldn't be an intelligent thing to do, of course, but that's the, the reasoning. So a lot of modern insecticides are mostly harmful to the insect, at least in that short-term, small amounts. Um, again, we're not talking about the old school insecticides that were more harmful. Um, back in the day, they could show people ingesting a spoonful of DDT to show that it wasn't harmful to humans, but yet it was very toxic to killing off mosquitoes. So that was when insecticides really took off. But we then we found out that that DDT was harmful to, for instance, bird of prey eggs. They become really fragile. Um, and so it was, there was all sorts of problems. And then of course, insects developed resistance, but I'm digressing a little bit. The point is, is insects have this hard outer shell that supports the internal organs, has a very strong tensile strength that pound for pound is similar to steel. They can form tubular structures. They can make the wings out of it, all sorts of things. They're membraneous, but yet hard. So here is the exoskeleton of an insect. So you can see that the muscles are attached internally. The hearts on the ups, remember I told you the inside out, so the hearts on their backside, this is also known as the dorsal side. The ventral side has a ventral nerve cord, while we have a dorsal nerve cord. So they're, why they're upside down in comparison to us, at least that's how they would refer to it. Notice how the muscles are attached to the exoskeleton. <clears throat> Some insects, the muscles attach directly to the wings. And in some cases, the wings don't really have direct, lots of direct muscle on it. And it's actually pulling down on the shell that moves the wing up and down. So there's direct flight and indirect flight, but that's kind of a side topic to this. The muscles actually are a lot like our muscles in many ways. They have, if you're familiar with physiology, they have myosin and actin and so forth. So, so the muscles are a lot like ours. The exoskeleton, again, is a hardened outer shell. And so a lot of times they'll have little fibers that are part of the exoskeleton that help them to sense the environment. Um, they're obviously important for water retention because remember insects are so small that it would be very easy for an insect to dry out if it didn't have that exoskeleton. So the exoskeleton helps retain the water that they have. It's obviously important for muscle attachments. Um, it provides the color for the insect. So you get the cuticle provides the iridescent colors of its scales like on a butterfly or a moth. But they can, so they can be very colorful as you know and provide all sorts of different ways of messing with the light to give them that iridescent look. Um, there's different layers that you can see that form the exoskeleton, but there's three primary layers. There's a basement membrane, an epidermis, and a cuticle. And so this is the cuticle would be the far outside and the basement membrane is the inner layer. And then of course the epidermis is in the middle. So here's our epicuticle. And so this would be kind of a waxy layer that helps in retaining water. So it kind of, it's, I believe it's just basically um, waxes and cements that harden. They come from secretions from these glands. So you can see the glands that provide the secretion, the dermal glands. So the dermal glands are providing the cement layer. And then you have your exoskeleton, or excuse me, exocuticle that makes up the exoskeleton. Then you have your endocuticle. And again, 
these are just layers of, um, I guess they're um, at this point, um, dead tissues that are kind of like males, you know, that they form the outside or the secretions or the these secretions of it. And then you have your basement membrane and your epidermis. And these are the living tissues that are providing all these secretions. So remember your bones aren't alive, but there are cells that make up like osteoblasts and osteocysts sites that are involved in structuring your bones, making them and in, 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 in structuralizing them. Well, these cells here are doing kind of the same thing. They're making the endocuticle and the exocuticle, the shell, which is the non-living portion. And then they're putting out that cement waxy layer from the dermal glands. <laughs> so this isn't really living portions. It's more like this would be kind of like the skeleton. And the living portion are these cells down here, the epidermis. And then again, there's these different um, cells that are associated with it. Wigglesworth was actually a very famous scientist that really is kind of like the father of insect anatomy. So what is the chemical composition of the cuticle? It's mostly made up of a polysaccharide. Remember, polysaccharides are sugars. Saccharides are sugars of poly, so it's a polymer. When we talk about joining multiple monomers together, I hope this little bit of biochemistry reminder doesn't confuse you. But when you join a bunch of little sugars together, you have, or other chemicals together, those monomers become a polymer. This is a fancy word for a bunch of monomers that are joined together. And in this case, the monomers are sugars, and so they're polysaccharides. And so that is what makes up the chitin. Where else do we find chitin as an outer wall? Plant so cells. Was, I'm sorry, or fungal, fungal cells. Yeah, fungal cells. Good job. And then there's other chemicals like resolin that's kind of a rubbery, high elastic that is also part of this cuticle. So there's chitin, there's resolin. And then what makes it kind of hard on the outside is another chemical called sclerotins. And so that's more on the outer shell of, the, of that, those layers. So an insect that's going through molt wouldn't have a lot of sclerotins. They would gotten rid of it. But when, it, when the molt is actually finalized and the insect is forming in that outer, you know, the, 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 the cuticle is becoming hard, then these sclerotins are forming. And again, it's a lot of these, you know, it's all these different tissue, these cells underneath that are making all this. And it's all being kind of combined in here. So there's chitin in here, the resolins in there. And it depends on which part of the body too. So like you'll find more resolin, I would assume near the wing or near the, the, the arms or legs, you know what I'm saying? While the outer shell would be more of the sclerotins. So it depends a lot on what, we're what region we're talking about. So the cuticle is thicker or thinner, more elastic in some areas and less elastic in others, based on which part of the body we're talking about. Um, again, there's gonna be all sorts of different pigments and that gives it all those beautiful colors. And again, you can imagine that anything that I'm talking about, this, these are like the most basic, Introduction to stuff. You could probably spend a lifetime trying to appreciate some of these chemicals and structural coloration as a lab. But what happens is you end up with brilliantly beautiful colors. These are a couple of tiger beetles, and they look like from the picture they're getting it on, <laughs> as you can see from the photo. But these are some tiger beetles. And uh, they're known for being predators that will run around eating other insects. I find a lot of these near the beaches or the sandbars in, on the Mississippi River. <clears throat> these scales um, are found on butterflies. And as you can see, they have a brilliant iridescent color. 
And even like with the um, tiger beetle, just based on the direction that the, um, the light is hitting it will affect the coloration. And so here you can look at the scales on a fine level, and then you can see the brilliant colors and the light hitting at different regions. And again, a cuticle is very important for water retention. We don't, as an insect, want to become desiccated easily. So to be able to walk around and take advantage of land resources and be terrestrial, you have to be able to retain water or your metabolism doesn't work and your cells dry out and so forth. <clears throat> Just like cells, this is actually, this would be a slide that we could talk about in regards to cells. Remember cells of bodies can only be a certain size because the, the faster that the cell gets bigger in surface area, the volume actually increases dramatically more than the surface area. You remember that kind of relationship when we talk about cells in a cell lecture? The idea is that cells of your body are small because you need a lot of surface area to volume to allow for diffusion to happen rapidly. Well, it seems to be that insects can only get to a certain size also because of the amount of gas it takes for diffusion to take place. And, and the weight of this skeleton and the volume of the insect makes it very impractical to have insects the size of humans, for instance, because their volume increases in relationship to their surface area dramatically. And they don't have lungs and blood vessels. They have, remember, spiracles and holes and air tubes. So they're not gonna be able to do the gas diffusion and and a lot of times their skeleton supposedly can't really hold up to the weight either if their body gets a lot bigger. So there's all sorts of problems that really restrict insects and that they think of that are based on physics and biology that keep them small. There have been some historically very big insects like dragonflies that they could be a couple wingspans, a couple feet wide back in the uh, dinosaur times. Um, but generally speaking, insects can't get to be the size of dogs and cats because of this problem of diffusion and surface area and volume and so forth and the weight of their cuticle. <laughs> but that's probably gets a little more complicated than what I've just described here. Let me just momentarily pause the recording. All right, so. Um, Remember when birds can move, or excuse me, when insects move their wings, they're able to communicate to one another. So when they open up their wings, they're actually communicating um, potentially to get mates if they have the right coloration. This is just hypothetical examples. Also, insects can sometimes have obnoxious um, eye spots on their wings. And this is a way to scare off predators like birds. So, all, so the coloration in a cuticle could be a very important form of communication for insects as well. <clears throat> Here's an example of coloration that is a warning to many animals, including ourselves. So here is the yellow, and you notice how there's this yellow and black color, and this is in a honeybee. But you see it, this kind of coloration on honeybees. And this is a usually a signal to your pet cat or whoever, once they've learned their lesson, to stay away from wasp. In fact, I run across people all the time that are scared to death if they see a wasp flying by them. But in reality, I'm not, if you're smart enough, you don't really have to worry about a wasp. I can chew them away with my hand all the time. Maybe that's the benefit of having a PhD in entomology. But the point is, is that this coloration is a signal to would-be predators or nuisance makers to leave me alone because I can sting you. That's what the colorization means. So it's a communication. Now, insect body regions are called tag, tag mosis. 
Again, these are modifications of segments into functional units. That's what tagmosis is. And so we, as I mentioned before, insects have three main body regions, a head region, a thorax, and an abdomen. So here's our three main segments. Notice that the legs are on the thorax. And then the abdomen is made up of uh, several regions, up to eight to 12 or so. That's where most of the digestion takes place and absorption. And um, we'll get into the internal anatomy a little bit later. Um, and then their head is are several um, segments that have been fused together. It depends a lot on the insect, Some, but a lot of insects have compound eyes. And each one of those eyes are made up of an eye called an omatidia. So compound eyes are made up of lots of little facets. You know, if you ever looked at a bee's eye, you'll see these lots of little, it's a compound eye with lots of little facets. So it's like having you know, 50 eyes or something. I don't know how many there are actually there, but each one of those is called an omatidia. Then on top of its head of insects, they have these little light sensing spots called ocilli. So whether they have a complex eye or not, a compound eye or not, they also have these other spots called ocilli that help them to pick up on light so they can tell if they're in a dark area or a bright area. So the simplest insects might not have the, like a caterpillar would have the ocilli, but not the compound eye. But when they became a butterfly, they would have the compound eye. <clears throat> and then they also have antenna. The antenna, you know, if you were a little kid, you might've thought the antenna was a pickup on radio waves. And, and I don't know if insects have any supernatural type of radio wave kind of thing. But I do know that the antenna are very good at picking up on pheromones. So they can pick up, uh, they might have a very fuzzy antenna that can pick up on a pheromone that allow a male insect to find a female insect to mate with it. So a lot of times you can tell it's a male insect, like a male butterfly or a male moth or whatever, because their antenna are typically <clears throat> much more fuzzy. And that fuzziness is just to be able to help them pick up on the female pheromones, and then that'll lead them to the female to mate with her. Obviously, the antenna can also not only be used for helping find a mate, but it might help them to find a food source, or you know they might be used to feel the area around them. So they are touch sensitive as well. <clears throat> this is a what they call a generalized head of an insect. So the more primitive insect, and this is, the, is actually considered a grasshopper. <clears throat> so this would be considered a primitive mouth parts that all the other mouth parts of insects derived from, meaning this is kind of the primitive state of insect head. This is... This is the generalized appearance. And from this, we get mosquito mouth parts or other more fancy mouth parts. But let's go ahead and go over the basic anatomy. And this is something that you should be able to, if I showed you this picture, you should be able to label it later if you happen to have a, a quiz or exam someday. Well, knock on wood, I mean, it's gonna happen, right? So <clears throat> make sure when you see something like this that you can, uh, fill in the blanks. So here's our compound eye. But we'll start with the easiest stuff first, most obvious. <clears throat> and then if you look at it, all the little facets are the omatidia. And then, as I mentioned before, there's little something like eyes that are less light gathering ocilli. I think that's how you pronounce it. Then you have your antenna. And then you have your mouth parts. The mouth parts are made up of multiple segments. So each one of these would be kind of like a segment of the animal that's kind of fused together to make up the, the complete mouth. 
And so you have the front of the mouth, we have the clippus, the labrum, and then right under the labrum are the mandibles. Those are the chewing mouth parts, right? As you can imagine by the name, mandibles. And then right behind the, mat, the mandibles is the labium, or excuse me, the maxilla, excuse me, the maxilla, then the labium. So just to go over that again, the front part is the labrum right here. So you got the clippus, the labrum, the mandibles, the maxilla, or the maxillary palp would be the same name, and the labrum, or the labial palp. So this is the simplified general mouth part. And what you're gonna see is that these same parts make up the mosquito mouth parts, which is a piercing sucking mouth part. This is a chewing mouth part. Anyway, here's the compound eyes. Look at all the little multifacets that are in there, all the omatidia. <clears throat> these are very important for insects, these type of eyes. They wouldn't, um, they all provide information to the brain. So it's like having lots of little pupas, pupil, you know, like we have a pupil. They're kind of doing the same thing. It's kind of like having the retina. It's, but it, well, the main thing is it really allows for them to have pretty good eyesight while being really, really small. They can't do what we do with a big eyeball. But they, but with this having evolved for them, it allows them to do what we can do to some degree. Now there's different types of mouth parts. These are all important to at least be familiar with these generalized mouth parts. The first one is known as chewing mouth parts. That's what you see like with this grasshopper. Those are known as chewing mouth parts. The mandibles chew. And they usually, have, it's not really shown very well, but they basically have little teeth like edges on their mandibles. And so here's the, um, so you know how when we talk about, when we think about animals like ourselves, you can look at a wolf and tell it's a carnivore, or you can look at a horse and tell it's a herbivore, or animals like us are omnivores, or we're somewhere in the middle. Um, you can see that also when you look at insects, you can see how they've evolved for different types of food. While herbivores like our grasshoppers have very strong chewing mouth parts. Again, it's gonna be a lot of that grinding. And remember when you grind against plant material like leaves and grasses, um, they're rough and they can break down those mouth parts. So they have to be strong molars. Now, what about if you are like the tiger beetle? Well, you need more fang-like mouth parts. You're not gonna have to grind as much, but you need to be able to grab what you're eating and break it down and, and more scissor-like cut. And then insects that live in water are gonna be filter feeders. So they're gonna have hair-like mouth parts. So the mouth parts can be modified a lot, but these are all examples of part of the chewing mouth parts. Just not to be confused. These are all examples of chewing mouth parts. And then we have insects that have what they call sectorial mouth parts. Some are known as piercing sucking. So this here is a sectorial mouth part that is piercing sucking. Um, this is a wheel bug, I believe is the proper name, or it could be also assassin bugs that have a piercing sucking straw-like mouth part. Here's the compound eyes, antennas. This is the head, thorax. You can see the wings kind of leathery. You can see the spiracles. But anyway, this straw-like mouth part can pierce an insect, inject poisons and drink it out. They can, and it depends on the type, whether if it's a stink bug, not this necessarily this species. This one is a predator 
or in some cases, these insects can bite you and give you a pretty nasty little pain. So just be kind of careful when you collect this one. I think it's called a wheel bug, but anyway, this is a type of, it's related to assassin bugs. Now let's look at the sectorial mouth parts of this mosquito. You'll see that the basic parts are still there, but they've evolved differently. In other words, there's a mandibles there. And so for, hang on one second. Somebody had a chat, let me pause for see what it is. Okay, let's watch the rest later. Thank you, Jada. So anyway, there's the labia, the labrum, the mandibles are still there, the maxilla are still there. So now that instead of being chewing mouth part, the mandibles are really small. Does that make sense, everybody? The labrum is up in front still. So if you go back and look at it, here's the labrum. The mandibles, so it all becomes a straw-like body mouth part through evolutionary selection. So there's, again, these are sectorial mouth parts. These are the piercing sucking so they can poke. And that's the piercing part. And then some are non-piercing. And that's typical of butterflies. So they have a long proboscis. But again, the same basic parts are there. The labial palps are there, the maxilla are there. And they form a straw that can unwind and then go and get nectar from a flower. Houseflies are also have sectorial mouth parts, but again, they're not necessarily piercing. Obviously, if you ever had a horse fly, you're going to get pierced by that and it'll bite you or hurt. But the typical housefly is sucking up and spitting out and sucking up, and it's all nasty because you don't want to eat. Once you realize that they're throwing up on your food, you're not too excited about eating the hamburger right after they sat on it. After, you know, they probably sat on the dog poop. <laughs> but anyway, the point though is here's again a modified, evolutionarily modified mouth part that had the same stuff. It had the maxillary palp, it had the labrum, it had the labium, it, and it all got modified. So it's kind of like, you know, when you have your arm, your arm has the same, the dog leg has the same bones as your arm or the bat wing or the bird wing. The difference is this is how those wings and bones have evolved and changed. Well, the mouth parts of insects have the basic same parts. They've just evolved and connected and, and changed shape. But the, but the hardcore scientists that study this realize that they're the same parts, just modified differently. So I think that wraps up the, this first part of our anatomy, then we'll get into more of that, more of the same later.